Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I'm excited to be continuing in our series, The Rest of the Story, where we've talked about weddings, marriages, family. We talked about something that some brides are sometimes worried about before the wedding, like tripping and falling down the aisle, or what the best man might say. I heard a story about a couple who had a different problem. It was with the mother-in-law. Now this can be, can be quite common. They make movies about it. It's so common, and it can be a problem for the bride, both before the wedding and for many years <laughs> after the wedding. But this particular mother-in-law was more like a monster-in-law, really bad. You see, she was a single mom for many years, had one child, her one and only son loved him, the apple of her eye. He could do no wrong, and there wasn't a woman in the world good enough for him, including the one he was about to get married to. She couldn't do anything right. In fact, the mother-in-law said of her, she had no redeeming qualities at all. She took it a step further. She said that that bride has no business wearing white on her wedding day. In fact, she said, this is my special day too. The mother of all bombs, she decided to wear white to the wedding. That's a big no-no in our culture anyway. Bride was really upset about it. They're going to premarital counseling so she's talking about it to the pastor and her husband. And finally, she says, you know, I have an idea. I have a plan, if you'll join me in it, to teach this woman a lesson. And surprisingly, they agreed. So the wedding day came. And sure enough, the monster-in-law wears the white dress to the wedding. Additionally, she wanted to be walked down the aisle. But sure enough, none of the other groomsmen were good enough to do that only her special boy. So here you have the groom walking his mom down the aisle to her seat. But when they get to the seat, they keep walking. She's a little startled now. She's kind of being dragged along right up to the front where the pastor is. But she remains composed. She doesn't want to be embarrassed, right? Her special day. So there's the bridal party. You have the groomsmen lined up and She's trying to play it cool, but she looks over at the bridal party and notices that the bride's standing there. It's already in the room, lined up with the other bridesmaids, not wearing white. She's wearing a red dress. That's weird. Well, she keeps it cool 
until the pastor foregoes the normal words that he would say at the beginning of a wedding. He looks at the mother-in-law and says, do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? The place erupts with laughter. Even if they didn't know the mother, they know she shouldn't be wearing white to this wedding. So she quickly says, no, he's my son. Of course not. The place erupts again with laughter. The pastor patiently waits for it to calm down and says, well then, perhaps there's someone else here who will redeem him. Now, you might be wondering, what happened? What did she do? Did she go and get changed and then do it again? Do a little redo? This thing was a joke? No. She didn't have to because she was Chinese. You see, in China, brides often wear red. Black and white are colors associated with mourning and death. So you see, the joke was on the monster-in-law the whole time. <laughs> Speaking of weddings and mother-in-laws, today we find ourselves in the book of Ruth, where we'll be looking at the rest of that story. A beloved novella, if you will. People really like this story a lot, but there are a few little details I hope to point out today. Ruth is placed between Judges and 1 Samuel. It acts as kind of a bridge. It gives us some lineage to David. So it's in the time of Judges, it tells us, and then we'll see that Ruth is David's great-grandmother. It sets him up there. We'll see that in Samuel. Samuel won't anoint him, David, king. Ruth, verse 1, chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malin and Killian died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or husband. Now, if you've ever read this as Op Oprah instead of Orpah, <laughs> totally cool. I did that for about five years. So anyway, <laughs> hard for me to say now, actually. Orpa, 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 not <laughs> Oprah. It's in the time of the judges. Now, ancient hearers, many people would hear these stories. Not a lot of people had the scrolls or could read. They would hear the story or read the story. They would pick up on some really obvious irony right away in the names. You'd be kind of chuckling, maybe. You'd know what was going to happen. You see, Malin and Killian, their names related to mortality and sickness. So it would be cluing you in to what's going to happen. There's some irony here. Elimelech means, God is my king. But not so much for this guy. You see, he's left the covenant community and gone to live with the Moabites. That's a no-no. So it's ironic. Now, if you remember the origins of Moab, remember the story of Lot, Sodom, and Gomorrah. This was the child birthed out of that incestuous relationship. Lot's daughters get him drunk and then sleep with him. This is where the Moabites come from. Furthermore, the law of Moses that we looked at earlier says they weren't to intermarry with them, and there's more. Deuteronomy 23.3, no Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants for 10 generations may be admitted into the assembly of the Lord. They're not allowed in church. These nations did not welcome you with food and water when you came out of Egypt. Instead, they hired Balaam, son of Beor from Pethor, in distant 
Aram Naharaim, to curse you. But the Lord your God refused to listen to Balaam. He turned the intended curse into a blessing because the Lord your God loves you. As long as you live, you must never promote the welfare and prosperity of the Ammonites or the Moabites. The Ammonites are the younger child of this incestuous relationship. Both of his daughters sleep with Lot. So you know the story, remember? Balaam and his donkey. Furthermore, they're not to intermarry. Places like Deuteronomy 7 command this. And also, according to Ruth Rabbah, so this is like Jewish commentary, they had study Bibles back then. Ruth was Orpah's sister. And the two were daughters of Eglon, the king of Moab. Remember Ehud? He stabbed Eglon in the belly and couldn't retrieve the dagger because he was heavy set. The Bible says something different, but apparently that upset some people. So I'll just say he was heavy set. What was the word we? Husky. He was husky. And so you could not retrieve the dagger. That's it. So here, Tying in Balak, King Balak, and Balaam. It all comes together. So now, Ruth hears that there's food in Judah again, in Bethlehem. So she decides to take her daughters-in-laws with her and go to Bethlehem. She's on her way there, and she turns to them and says, you know what, why don't you girls just go back to your people? Just leave. So they all break down and cry. And they say, no, we want to go with you. We'll we'll go, we'll stay. She says, no. And then she gives a sarcastic kind of speech. At first, some logic. I'm too old to have children. But then she continues, well, even if I produced children for you to then marry, you're going to wait around for that, (laughs) right? 15 years, maybe 16 years in those days. So she's being kind of sarcastic. She says, no, I am bitter. The Lord has raised his fist against me. Well, Orpah decides to go. She kisses her mother-in-law and leaves. But Naomi clings to her. Well, or Ruth clings to her, sorry. Switch the names there. A little dyslexia. At least I got it. Ruth clings to Naomi. But Naomi points out, your sister has gone to be with her people and her gods. You go do the same. But she protests. She refuses. And then we get the famous line, Ruth 1.16. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Let nothing but death separate us. Now you know where those song lyrics come from. When we sing it, maybe some of you will think, wow, those are out of context, aren't they? (laughs) But I guess it's okay to apply it to Jesus. I'll stop being a Bible nerd and just sing the song. Now, Naomi's lack of response is kind of funny. It just says in the original language, she stopped talking to her. (laughs) That's it. Wherever you go, I go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Let nothing but death separate us. Meh. That's it. No words from her. (laughs) So they get back to town. People in town recognize Naomi. They say, oh, look, it's Naomi. And she says, no, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. She says, call me Mara, which means bitter. The Lord has raised his hand, his fist against me. Now, if you've been paying attention, this should remind you of something. A place in Exodus 15. Do you remember the first Passover? Right? They cross the sea, and then the Egyptians pursue. The waters crash down on them. They sing a song of deliverance in Exodus 15. And then you have the story of the bitter water. They can't drink the water there. It's too bitter. So Moses throws a log or a piece of wood in there, and now all of a sudden it's okay to drink. The world's first water purification system, I guess. But anyway, that place was named Mara because the water was bitter. Same word used here to describe herself. And indeed, they come back poor and bitter. They have nothing. Ruth chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Now, there was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem named Boaz, who was a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. So 
Here, it cuts to a scene where Ruth is going to ask Naomi if it's okay to gather some grain in the fields. But it's not like working the fields, like harvesting the fields. In the law, they had laws to be charitable to people. So Leviticus 19.9, places like that, it'll say that when you harvest the grain, the wheat, if you drop some, leave it. Don't trim the edges of your field. That's for the poor people. And so it's just to be charitable. And this is what Ruth is doing. So you have to picture her as a very destitute and poor person. So she's in this field as they're harvesting, and she's picking up what they're dropping, the leftovers. Well, sure enough, it's Boaz's field. He notices her, and he asks his foreman, who's that girl? And the foreman says, ah, that's a Moabite woman. She's been working here since morning. She's been hard at work all day except for a little bit in the shelter. She took a break. Now notice, it's pointed out, she's a Moabite woman. So here you already have that cultural divide going on. So maybe it's kind of difficult for her to be living there. She's a Moabite. They're not really desirable people. The people can't intermarry with them. So Boaz goes up to her and he lets her know, you can keep doing what you're doing. I've told the men not to harass you. If you need a drink of water, go ahead and be my guest. And she's amazed. She throws herself at his feet. Thank you for being so kind to me. But again, I'm only a foreigner. She points that out to him. Then he says, Ruth 2, starting at verse 11, yes, I know, Boaz replied, but I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live among complete strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. So now lunchtime comes. He welcomes her to eat with them. Dip your bread in the sour wine, he says. So she eats the roasted grain, and has lunch. She goes back out to work. She continues working. It's very interesting because then there are instructions given. Not only are you not to pick up the stuff you dropped, you're actually supposed to intentionally drop stuff at her. Right? Increasingly more charitable to her. So just, you know what, chuck some at her. Let her pick those up. She gathers up a whole lot and comes home to Naomi. Brings home the leftovers from lunch. Brings home what she gathered up. Naomi says, where did you get all this stuff? And so she says, what happened, right? Boaz, he's been so great to me. She says, oh, that guy's our next of kin, our family redeemer. This is good. So she continues to work through the barley harvest in the spring, the wheat harvest in the summer for a couple of seasons. And then it cuts away to another scene. Some time goes by and Naomi hatches a plan. It's kind of a risky one. So again, you're gonna go to Boaz and he'll be threshing on the threshing floor. And here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna get dolled up. <laughs> so you're gonna wash, you're gonna take a bath. It's been a while. You're going to anoint yourself with some perfume and lotions. And then you're going to put on a nice set of clothes, a new set of clothes. And here's what you're going to do. Boaz is going to be resting on the threshing floor. You're going to uncover his feet, and you're going to lie down at them. And he'll tell you what to do once that happens. Okay. So she goes and does it. And here I'll just stop to explain something because it's not always obvious. The Bible talks a lot about threshing wheat and winnowing. And a lot of people don't know what that is. I didn't either when I first came to the Bible because it's not something I do. It's not very common. And today, if you're harvesting and stuff, we have machinery for that. So it's not the same. But if you can go on YouTube, it's kind of interesting and see that some cultures still do this. So you've cut down, you know, whatever crop, let's say it's wheat. Now you want to thresh it out. So you're separating the wheat from the chaff. And so what they'll do is they'll put it on a large threshing floor. Imagine like a concrete patio, a really big one, and you can beat it out with certain tools. There are certain tools I've seen online which are interesting. There's like this rotating paddle on a stick and they're sitting there, standing there beating it. It's a lot of hard work. I've also seen uh, a guy dragging a giant piece of wood with a donkey over it all to kind of crush it or beat it out. A lot of work. And then in the evening, when the cool breeze comes through, you're going to winnow the grain. And so they have a winnowing fork, like a pitchfork, and they'll throw it up in the air, and then the chaff will fly away, the grain will fall down to the ground. For me, this is called an allergy nightmare. 
<clears throat> so that's what it is. So you're picturing that, a lot of hard work. Boaz is threshing out the grain all day. He gets something to eat and drink. It's in the evening, and he lies down and falls asleep. Now, in the story, there are a couple of implications. So it insinuates something, maybe that he's drunk, and are also some sexual insinuations here. And I'll explain them to you. So she sneaks in, uncovers his feet. Now, if you remember, Moses' wife, Zipporah, not Sephora, <laughs> she circumcised his son. And it says he touched the foreskin to his feet. So sometimes that's a polite way of saying something else. We don't know because it does say feet, but there's a lot of implication here. It's hinting at a lot, right? He'll tell you what to do. So she uncovers his feet and lays down. He doesn't notice, and so there's the other suggestion. How would he not notice this unless maybe he had been drinking? It suggests that. He turns over in the middle of the night and then wakes up. Who are you? He says, I'm Ruth, your servant. You are my family redeemer. Put the corner of your cloak over me, cover me. So what this is like is, take me under your wing. It's like marry me, right? So it would mean something. Take me under your wing. Well, he uses some interesting language. And if you know the word really well, this is a really cool connection. He says, I know that you're a virtuous woman. And the language there is almost identical to the Proverbs 31 woman. King Lemuel's mom gave him that advice, a proverb kind of originally told by a woman. And she's saying, stay away from alcohol. That's the first piece of advice she gives him. And then here's the kind of woman that you're going to want to marry, a virtuous woman, it says. Same type of language here. But he says, well, it's true. I'm your family redeemer. There's another redeemer who's in line ahead of me. So... I'm going to go check with him tomorrow. Stay the night here, right? They don't want to cause a scandal. No one should see you leaving. She stays the night, gets up in the morning while it's still dark. Well, none of the neighbors can see her. And she leaves, but before she does, he gives her six scoops of barley, a pretty generous amount. Now, most versions from Hebrew or in English will say he put it in her cloak or her veil. But the Greek is very interesting. Again, it suggests something, gives a little foreshadowing. It says, he put it in her apron. And so you're going to get a suggestion, a picture of what is about to happen. It's a little bit more interesting. So she goes back, she leaves in the secret. She tells Naomi what happened. Naomi says, he's a good guy, he's going to straighten this out for us today, essentially. So now you end up with another scene at the town gate. This is really interesting. Because again, in Proverbs 31, the husband really isn't mentioned a lot. The wife does all this really great stuff, and the husband just sits around at the town gate and brags about her. That's really all he does. That's his only role. So it's like me and Heather, basically, it there. <laughs> so you get that scene. Now, remember, the gates of Gaza was a Gaza, right? That Samson picked up and took away, almost an impossible feat took away these big town gates. It was a place of commerce where people met, a very, very important place. Why it's mentioned in Proverbs 31, he's meeting with the town elders. And this is what Boaz does. He goes there, the other redeemer is there, an unnamed man. He gets together 10 elders or leaders of the town to be witnesses. And he says, well, you know, Elimelech, Malin and Killian, they're dead, everybody knows that. Well. His estate's up for sale. Naomi's selling it. Do you want to buy it? He says, sure, I'll buy it. But Boaz has a card. He's kept close to the vest. He says, but Ruth comes with it. Now, again, another suggestion, because he changes his mind. He says, no, that would damage my inheritance. I can't do it. We don't know why, but maybe he doesn't want to marry a Moabite woman. We don't really know. A lot of suggestions in this story. So he says, no, I can't do it. You redeem the property. Now I'll explain something. Women back then were sometimes seen as property. 
So they would be sold with an estate, along with like the slaves and other things like that. It just is what it is, the culture back then. Also, we have another thing going on here that might not be obvious to you. Back then they had levirate marriage. So you see this earlier on in the Law of Moses. It's where if a brother dies, the next one down steps up to the plate, produces an heir. That is the point. So if you remember the story of Judah and Tamar, this is how this started. Ur dies because he's a wicked man. Again, we don't know why. Then Onan steps up to the plate and does something disgusting. He doesn't do the deed. And then Sheila's hidden from him. This is Judah is their father. And so Tamar decides she's going to get her heir by tricking Judah into sleeping with her by playing the prostitute. Kind of a crazy story. And we'll see that this is now going to connect. It's going to have Perez, and you'll see in a minute how this goes together. So this is kind of the concept that's going on. They're relatives. They're family redeemers. And so they would redeem Ruth being a relative. That's how it worked back then. Again, that's what went on then. Now, something really interesting happens, and there's a little bit behind it. It's kind of funny to us and to the hearers of the story in that day. We get some indications that this may have been written way later because they do something funny. The other unnamed redeemer takes his sandal off and hands it to Boaz. And it said, in those days, this is how you would validate a transaction. There's a hint there, in those days. So in other words, the writer knows that why did he hand him a sandal? It wasn't completely obvious. Now, if you and I decide to make a deal, do not take off your sandal and hand it to me. That's disgusting. It's been on the bathroom floor. Keep your sandals on. Do not validate the transaction in that way. But why the sandal? Well, it was a thing back then, but this was the idea of relinquishing the responsibility and passing it on to someone else. Boaz is now taking it. Also, if it's property, they might measure out a field with these sandals. So those are the representations quite possibly. And connecting the dots, there's kind of another funny story. If you know the word well, you might be thinking about it. We're talking about this type of marriage. There's a command to do it. Then we see that there are some commands about what happens when someone doesn't want to do it. They're not always going to be struck down like Onan. So it says this, Deuteronomy 5, starting at verse 7. But if the man refuses to marry his brother's widow, she must go down to the town gate and say to the elders assembled there, my husband's brother refuses to preserve his brother's name in Israel. He refuses to fulfill the duties of a brother-in-law by marrying me. The elders of the town will then summon him and talk with him. If he still refuses and says, I don't want to marry her, the widow must walk over to him in the presence of the elders, pull his sandal from his foot, and spit in his face. Do not. <laughs> This is the law. We're not under the law of Moses anymore. Then she must declare, this is what happens to a man who refuses to provide his brother with children. Ever afterward in Israel, his family will be referred to as the family of the man whose sandal was pulled off. I'm not making that up. Check in your Bible. <laughs> then Ruth and Boaz get married they have a son, Obed, which means servant of God. And here we find the rest of the story in King David. Ruth 4.16, Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast, and she cared for him as if he were her own. The neighboring women said, now at last, Naomi has a son again. And they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. But the rest of that story is found in Jesus. The story takes place in Bethlehem. Many of you know that is where Jesus was born. Did you know? Bethlehem means house of bread. 
And it gets, really, and it gets even more interesting. Because you see in the Greek version, it says that Naomi and Ruth, they were going to Bethlehem to get bread, arton, not just any bread, the holy bread. So it kind of foreshadows something because Jesus said of himself that he was the bread of life. Interesting connections here. Orpah kisses her mother-in-law, and some say this prefigures the betrayal, Judas betraying Jesus, going back before she goes back to her other gods. Ruth's unnamed relative unwittingly speaks truth when he says he will lose his inheritance. In the passing of the sandal, we see the passing of the law and the advent of Christ. Ruth prefigures the Gentile church who would be grafted in to the family of promise. And Boaz prefigures Christ, our Redeemer. And indeed, he is in our Redeemer's family line. It gets even more interesting if we go to the first book of the New Testament. We see Jesus' genealogy, and in it, Matthew 1, starting at verse 5, says, Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. In this genealogy, we see some pretty remarkable things. One is that there are four undesirable women named in it. If we go back to verse 3, it says, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. So that's Judah and Tamar, the father-in-law with the daughter-in-law. <clears throat> so you remember that story in Genesis 38. Note, Boaz's mother. It might be helpful if we can click back one slide, and you'll see the genealogy there. Boaz's mother was who? Rahab, who was a prostitute. So we have someone playing the prostitute, having an incestuous relationship, and someone who's actually a prostitute in Jesus' family tree. Think about that. Ruth, a Moabite woman. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot? Not good. And Bathsheba. Now, this version is an easy-to-read version. It's designed for people who might not know the word very well, so they explain a few things. They'll do parenthetical extras, which I don't think is a bad thing for people who don't know it well. But if you're reading the original, it doesn't explain so much. It just says, Uriah's wife, which tells you what they did. David produced Solomon with somebody else's wife. This easy-to-read version is actually kind of nice because she wasn't yet a widow when he slept with her. In fact, he went and got Uriah killed, an adulterer and a murderer in Jesus' genealogy, in his family tree. Think about the implications. Now, as a side note from an apologetic standpoint, this is pretty amazing because if you were going to make up a story like we see for people like Alexander the Great, you might leave a lot of this stuff out, wouldn't you? I was going to make up a story about someone, and it was fake. I wouldn't put these people in it. Uh-uh. No good. But they put the women in there when they don't even have to, mentioning things like, oh, yeah, his mom was Rahab, the prostitute. Why would you do that? Gee, I wonder. This speaks of redemption, being redeemed in Christ, right from the very beginning, the part that people skip, the genealogy, it's talking to you. It's telling you that if you're in this family line, you're redeemed. If you are a part of Jesus' family, you're redeemed. What does it end with, right? Go, make disciples of all nations. Gather them into the family. Graft them in. Go to everybody. At first, the people, the lost sheep of Israel. But now, everybody, the ethnies, all ethnicities, from beginning to end, you, if you are in Christ, are redeemed. There is a pathway to redemption. As Ruth found it, 
in Bethlehem, ours too is found in a person born in Bethlehem, our Redeemer, Jesus. As Ruth was faithful and loyal and followed Naomi, we too must have faith and follow Jesus. If we keep reading Matthew's gospel account, we get to chapter 10. Jesus says this, Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Don't imagine that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. There's a quote of Micah. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son and daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. But if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. I noted Micah in there. It's not the Micah of Micah's idols, but it's a prophecy. And in that prophetic book, chapter 5, verse 2, it says that a child will be born in Bethlehem, who will be your Lord. All comes full circle. Jesus says we must follow him. Like Ruth, we must leave certain things and follow Jesus. In that story, and even in this one, we must cling to Christ. Jesus, wherever you go, I will go. Even if it's hard, I will follow you. I will cling to you. This requires loyalty. The passage is not about intentionally dishonoring our families, Matthew 10, or committing acts of violence. The sword is figurative. It's about loyalty to Jesus, regardless of what family we are born into. Regardless of what the circumstance, we must always choose Jesus, even when it's difficult. It won't be easy. It wasn't easy for Ruth. Think about it. She left her family, left her gods. Orpah went back. And if the commentary is true, wow, their dad's pretty high up there. Must have been nice. She left all that. She became impoverished, scavenging in the barley or wheat field. It's difficult. She had to do some pretty daring stuff. And for us too, it may be difficult. But our faith and loyalty to our Lord lead to our redemption in Jesus. You see, Ruth could have gone back to her gods, but she chose faithfulness over family and her former life. And we too must follow Jesus. Maybe it doesn't mean leaving our family. Maybe everything's fine there. But it does mean leaving our former life. It does mean leaving our gods, leaving some of the other things that maybe we used to worship and following Jesus, clinging to him instead. And so we have choices. And we must choose to move forward in Christ. We must choose our Redeemer who paid the ultimate price for us. And so, remember that you have a Redeemer in Jesus Christ who paid the ultimate price for you to bring you into his loving arms under his wing, so to speak, into his protection, his provision, and into the family of faith. And so, as we go out this week, let's keep that in mind. And we're a part of this family. And let it change our behavior and mold us into Christ Jesus. 
Let me pray for you from the scriptures. Ephesians 1, 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased your freedom, redeemed us with the blood of his son, and forgave our sins. All glory and honor to him forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.